Hey, welcome. Boy, it's Sunday already. I had a nice three-day weekend. It was fun. I hope you enjoyed Thursday's show. I enjoyed doing Thursday's show. And I'm going to try and get her back on later on because I think she's a fun lady to talk to. Uh, my name is Charlotte. I'm going to be your host for the next maybe, what, hour and a half reading The Ghost of Flight 401. This is for people that don't usually come in or come see this. This is our Sunday fun day read. We lay back, you know, we just kick back, drink co cocoa or whatever, and just rest. There's no formality to it. We just read. I, I just read out of The Ghost of Flight 401. It's a, every Sunday. It's a, it's a, it's a ghostly themed book. And I have news because one of our guests uh, that's going to be on Wednesday, I'm not going to say who, tell, us, tell Tuesday, but our guest who will be with us Wednesday writes horror theme and ghost theme books. So she has offered to let me have her short stories. So after the Ghost of Flight 401 is done, we'll start, I'll, I'll, we'll, well, we'll, we'll, you, you'll be hearing them, I'll start reading them. So I'm going to start reading her short stories. So that'll be kind of fun. Um, also some announcements, I'm going to start, uh, reviewing paranormal equipment that'll be up on the YouTube page. That's new. Um, also for those of you that, uh, aren't aware of it, maybe a different crowd coming in on Sundays. I do have a class on the 12th at 2 PM, uh, where I'm going to be teaching protection techniques. So if you're a paranormal investigator, or maybe you might have some stuff going on at your house, or maybe you might be psych, you might have psychic abilities and you want to learn how to protect yourself better. This is the class to take. So pop on over to CaliforniaHauntsRadio.com and check that out. And all you have to do is go all the way over to the last category, click on it at the top. It'll take you into special events, and that's where you can sign up for the class. So if you're interested in learning about that kind of thing, just go on over because I will be teaching about just about everything you can think of for protection, grounding, you name it. Um, you're getting a couple extra minutes when it goes to Flight 401. Uh, like I said, we're laid back here at Sunday. Uh, we're usually laid back doing the show anyway, but on Sundays, we're especially laid back. We, uh, you know, this, this, this is like everybody else, you know, either out mowing your lawn or doing whatever. Maybe you went to church earlier today or whatever, but, uh, you know, grab your coffee, grab your snacks, grab whatever you need and uh, sit back, put your feet up, put me up on your TV screen. You don't want to look at me. <laughs> you don't want to look at me. Just put, just put me on your phone or your tablet and just turn the sound on, right? So you don't have to look at me. It's all good. We're just laid back here. Just like me, I'm laid back here. It's no no formal stuff like you can see in the back. Uh, the new backdrop just isn't quite fitting the way I wanted it to. Last week it bugged me. So I'm readjusting it. And I just got the extra parts thing that I need to make even more adjustments to it. You can see some light kind of coming through up there behind me. I'm going to fix all that. So like, I, you know, I could have done it today, but phew, it's Sunday. So by tomorrow it'll look really nice <laughs> and, and, and adjusted. But uh, I want to th everybody that comes here on Sundays to to hear this and on the podcast and see me actually read out of a book. I thank you very much for coming and attending because it's it's really fun to do this. You know, I, I just enjoy it. I love reading books, and uh, there's no other place I'd rather be is here with you guys. Trust me. You know, you can just think I I have no life. I have no life. COVID, right? And uh, all this stuff with COVID, and you know, I'm I, I have health problems as it is, so. This is what I do. This, you know, this is my thing is to talk to you guys out, out in the real world. When we left our book, I kind of did something I don't normally do last week is I stopped uh, mid chapter with it because we had gone, we were going on two hours there and I didn't want everybody to have to sit there for two hours. So I try to keep it down to an hour and a half when I read. But um, we kind of left in the middle so that we could do a quick update about what the book is, if, if you'd like, and where we're at with the book. Okay. John G. Fuller, uh, the author of the book, who's now, I think he's deceased now, uh, was in the process of writing a couple other books when he used to fly around to promote his books. And as he was flying around, he started to hear stories from the stewardesses and rumors about a, a couple aircraft that were haunted. So he started talking with stewardesses and they kind of gave him information, but he was so busy with his other books, he really didn't have time to start on this one or even think about doing this one. So he just put some feelers out. We got an assistant to do some research. And the more he dug, the, the more stories came up. So where we're at now with this is he has already told how the plane crashed, what led up to the crash. And now he's finding himself with a little more time to dig into it. He's met people with the airlines that have stories to tell. And now he's starting to interview more and more people, as is his assistant. Because uh, and he's actually got other stewardesses 
on the flights that he left his name with that are bringing him information as well. So that's where we're at with this. So in about a minute here, we're just going to take off where we left. We're just going to start up where we left off and uh, read from there. And we'll read for an hour and a half today. And I think we've got today and next week. And I think we're going to be done, I think. Okay, because from what? Let me see this here. Let me see my tablet. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. From what the tablet's telling me, we've got what's well, not telling me anything. I believe we're 51%. So we're a little over halfway in the book. So we may even have a week after the next week, but we'll see how it goes today. But again, I want to welcome everybody. And like I said, put your feet up, relax, grab a blankie, sit by the fire, do whatever it is you do when you relax. And I'm going to read your book. I'm going to read your spooky book. And it's it's starting to get spooky where they're seeing these pilots, more, these, uh, these things more on the plane. And, and it seems like the more they see them, the bolder, I can't say bolder because I'm a ghost hunter, but you know maybe they're... From the other side, they're getting more confident in appearing. Okay, so here we go. The Ghost of Flight 401, and like I said, about two and a half hour read tonight. Jenny Packard, who's a stewardess, by the way, was particularly wary of the situation because of her experience in the galley when the face had formed clearly and unmistakably beside her. It was a much greater shock than the first experience, where she and Denise had only sensed a presence and not seen anything. Jenny was a sensible, practical girl. She was intelligent, witty, and not at all prone to flights of fancy. And she was also convinced of her own sanity and rational capacity for observation. She was popular and had many friends, all of whom regarded her with some warmth and respect. She had re-examined the chilling incident in the galley in her mind, trying to rationalize it and to convince herself it was a product of her imagination. Each time she tried, she was forced to bring herself back to the conclusion that she had seen the face, the hair, the glasses, form and graphic reality in front of her. She did not believe in ghosts and did not subscribe to any such stories. She shared her concern with her husband, Fred, a prominent young executive with another airline. Her, he fully reassured her of her sanity and helped her to laugh at the incident, whatever it was. He pointed out that he knew Jenny's strengths and weaknesses better than anyone and that she was as much as realist as he was. When he heard the report of the Newark incident, which included as witnesses, a senior airline captain, a stewardess, a flight supervisor. He pointed out to her that she was now off the hook and that she didn't need to worry anymore. His confidence in her, in her cheered her up considerably because she was scheduled from Miami to New York to turn around the next day, flying up on flight 26 and returning on 401 again. Jenny had no fear of the plane. In fact, she felt safer on it than on any other craft, nor did she have any fear of another strange encounter. She was actually intrigued by it now. I'm sorry, she was actually intrigued by it now that the chill had worn off. Her fear was not a lack of confidence in herself. It was more that she was afraid of what others would think if she let them know what she had seen. Fred drove her to Miami International Airport that afternoon. She had regained her old lively spirit. She kissed him goodbye and went down the ramp to the plane. She peeked out the concourse window at the tail section where the plane number was displayed. It read N318EA, the official designation for Eastern's L1011 plane number 318. Good, Jenny said to herself. I'm ready for anything. Flight attendants Denise Woodruff and Doris Elliott found themselves in Newark three days after the startling incident in the first class section of plane 318. In defense of her own sanity for her from her previous experience with Jenny, Jenny, Denise was determined to find out what had happened in, in the Newark incident in more detail. The details of the story that were circulating were amazingly consistent, but Denise wanted to know more. Doris joined her in this feeling. They were not dealing with a ghost story of old English castles or huge Victorian mansions. This was the modern jet age. The ambiance was stacked against the conventional stories of ghosts. And further, the new work incident was not dealing with any other transparent ga ga gauzy image. It was dealing in a fully three-dimensional apparition that appeared completely solid, and then simply disappeared. At Newark, Denise and Doris were pleased to notice that their return trip would be on plane 318. This would give them a legitimate chance to check the plane's logbook where every incident, minor or major, had to be recorded by FAA regulation. These reports accumulated in the official logbook over an extended period of time and became a permanent part of the aircraft's record. The logbook remains on the aircraft until it is filled up, usually a period of two or three months. The pilot's record 
the pilots record the mechanical inc incidents on one side of the page, the flight attendants do the same on the opposite side. At the end of each trip, the senior flight attendant will write up her CDR, short for Cabin Discrepancy Report, on gum stickers. These, in turn, are pasted to the proper page of the logbook to become part of the permanent record, side by side with the flight crew's technical report. Before they boarded the plane for their assigned flight, Denise and Doris went to the crew scheduling office to talk to Hal Griffith, a friend of theirs, to get more definite information about the uncanny story of, dis of, of the disappearing captain. As a crew scheduler, he would get his information firsthand. Hal confirmed the story in detail. The entire flight crew had left the plane. He told them, reported the incident, entered into, and entered it in the log. The flight had been delayed for almost an hour. Eventually, the flight did go out, and it was an eventful. The confirmation by the crew scheduler was more than Doris and Denise expected. They had been sure that the details must have been exaggerated and distorted as they made, their, as they made the rounds of the flight attendant lounges the ticket counters, the baggage handlers, or the reservation staff. It seemed that everywhere they went, Eastern personnel were talking about it. It seemed so incredible. Their own experiences, along with Jenny Packard, seemed pale in comparison. As they prepared to board plane number 318 for the return trip, the first thing they planned to do was look at the logbook. They found it and picked it up with considerable tension and expectation. When they opened it, they noticed something very strange. All the pages up to and including the date of the incident, had been removed, contrary to general practice. Whatever comments recorded by the captain and crew of that unusual flight were completely missing. Puzzled and somewhat miffed, Denise and Doris went about their jobs of preparing the plane for the flight home, I mean, for, for the return flight. It was strange that the old pages logbook had been removed. On the other hand, it was understandable. How could a flight crew make a technical report on the appearance of an apparition? Or, if they had recorded the incident, how would they describe it? If the incident was as graphic and true as the evidence seemed to indicate, there were some important questions that could that needed to be asked. Was this an indication of, that an individual could survive after death and return in such a vivid form that a technically minded flight crew could be overwhelmed by it? Like Ginny and Doris, Denise was no longer afraid after her own experience. Her curiosity was mounting. When she, went to, when she went down to work in the galley, she actually found herself hoping she might encounter another incident. With over 200 meals to prepare, however, she had little time for dreaming. She began organizing her routine for the flight. Her fear is no longer with her, but her curiosity burning more intensely than ever. And yet, in spite of this, she found herself unconsciously hanging her garment bag over the oven of the right bay one, making sure that there would be no reflection. Was it utterly absurd? To seek behind, let's see, behind the ordering structures of this world and consciousness whose intentions were those very structures? We sense that the meaning of consciousness becomes what becomes wider and at the same time vaguer if we try to apply it outside the human realm. The positives have a simple solution. The world must be divided into that which we can say, which we can say clearly and the rest which we had better pass over in silence. But can anyone conceive a more pointless philosophy seeing that we can only clearly, seeing what, what we can say clearly amounts to the next nothing. Next chapter. The stories were pretty heady stuff and hard to absorb. After she had recounted her part of the story, Denise said, the strange part was missing the logbook pages. Every time we get our hands on 318's log, it would always be a new one. But the things that happened to us before any of the stories began circulating. We weren't influenced by them all, at all. All we wanted to do was to keep quiet about it as far as Eastern was concerned and keep it among ourselves. Later, when many girls started refusing to go down the lower galley, I used to say to them, why are you so afraid of someone who has never done anything? He's always been helpful as far as I've heard. All right, I said, the most graphic appearance seems to be the one at Newark. How can I get more information on that? Who was the captain? Can you remember the date? Now you come to the big problem, Denise said. Emily Palmer, who's been keeping very thorough notes on the incidents, has a lot of trouble with this sort of thing. Have you talked with her yet? I told her I had talked briefly with her and was going to see her shortly. Good, Denise said. She'll be very helpful, as long as you keep her name out of the papers. Anyway, the trouble she's found is that when you have an incident like the one at Newark, 
everybody is so freaked out about it, they forget to notice all the details they normally would. People talk much more freely than because of the excitement because of the excitement of the time. But the next day, they'll clam up and pretend to know nothing about it. They're running scared. Take me, for instance. I never remember to write down dates or flight numbers, but I can remember the incidents very clearly. The cockpit crews don't like to talk about the incidents at all. It's just like the UFO situation. Pilots will admit confident, you know, confidentially that they've seen them, but they've, lear- but they've learned now to never report them or talk about them on the outside. I learned later more about the problem Denise was talking about. I was lucky that the flight attendants I was interviewing were willing to share whatever information they had with me. Others were not so cordial, perhaps because they were distressful. In a way, I couldn't blame them. Most people are very reluctant to talk about experiences considered to be paranormal. The fear of ridicule seemed to be so strong, as strong as lose the fear of losing a job. You've got over 5,000 flight attendants on Eastern and more than 2,000 pilots and engineers. You can't get their home phone numbers. Even, even we can't get them from the office. And you don't know who to call if you did. I don't envy you your job. I was beginning to think she was right. It was frustrating. The story was elusive. The research seemed even more so. The three flight attendants seemed unanimous in feeling that there were, there were many more incidents with, the second, off, with second Officer Repo than with Captain Loft. There were no reports that anyone heard regarding the reappearance of First Officer Stockskill. The problem is, Doris Elliott said, that I would love to have another experience, in a way. I honestly think it reflects the possibility of life after death, and I dig that. Sometimes when I'm down in the galley alone, I'll kid around and say, Repo, I don't mind talking to you, but I don't have time. Check me later, but I've got lots of people to feed. The fact is, the reports the fact is, the reports have stopped completely now. I haven't even heard any for months. There was no question about the affection most crew members felt about Don Repo. He was a very virile looking man, Jenny said, and very strong, but he was so soft-spoken I never heard him raise his voice once. And he was so much fun. He laughed with us all the time and was constantly pulling, pulling little gags or coming up with a new joke. His sense of humor was terrific. If you wanted to describe him, that's the first thing you'd think of. Everybody who knew Repo described him in this way. He was competent and thorough in his job and enlightened it with an infectious sense of humor. This was true, it seemed, of the trio who described him to me that day. The only thing to discount about their comments was their natural exuberance, which was high-spirited and might have led to some decoration of detail. Then Jenny volunteered another incident that she couldn't explain, which still bothered her. She was on cabin duty and on flight 26, plane 318, heading for New York. She was determined that if she ran into any more strange incidents, she would make sure someone else was around and that she would be the last and that she would be the last to report it to anyone. Two experiences were enough. The flight was relatively smooth except for some minor low altitude turbulence. After they had passed through it, the plane slow, showed a tendency to roll slightly to the right, then straighten and roll to the right again. This continued for a considerable time, until landing at Kennedy in New York. The plane was checked thoroughly there, with the, hyd- with the hydraulic and-, and electrical control systems carefully tested. No apparent reason for the roll was found. Minor adjustments were made, however, and plane 318 took off again on schedule from Kennedy to Miami International as Flight 401. It wasn't long before the plane began the slight roll to the right again, followed by the equally slight recovery motion. It was somewhat annoying, but not really disturbing. Jenny went about serving the beef eater martinis and scotches, the Cokes, you know, from her beverage cart, a little annoyed at the slight yaw to the right, but not concerned about it. She was approaching the cabin section, situated over the wing area, when a man sitting there called her down the aisle to him. He pointed out the window and said to her, What is that over the wing? Jenny bent down and looked out. Out toward the wingtip was a luminous, hazy mass that was definitely not a cloud because its mass was opaque and it hovered over the wing as it continued moving along with the plane. Jenny watched it with the passenger for some time. They noticed that the mass, about the size of a large piece of luggage, would rise up a few feet off the wing, and as it did, the plane would level out. Then the mass would settle down on the wing. As it did, the plane would distinctly dip. Then the process would repeat itself over and over. 
After they had watched it for several minutes, the passenger suggested that Jenny might want to go up and notify the flight engineer. She did so hesitantly. He came back from the cockpit with her and joined the passenger and Jenny to observe it. It must be a cloud, the engineer said. It'll go away. The passenger protested. He told the engineer that they had been watching him for several minutes. The engineer stayed there for some time and was frankly baffled. His only theory was that it was condensation, but he thought it was a weak theory. He assured them that the plane was perfectly safe in spite of the roll and that he would have a check when they landed in Miami. About a half an hour later, the plane began rolling to the left, continuing in a similar pattern as before. By now, Jenny had reached the point where she was more interested than concerned or worried. When a passenger sitting over the wing section on the left side called her across the aisle, she was almost able to take it as a matter of course. She joined the passenger in looking out. The luminescent mass was there again on the other side, on the other wingtip. And the plane was not rolling as long as it was above the wing. But when it came down and sat on the wingtip, the plane would roll and the controls could not correct it. The plane landed safely at Miami International and Jenny went home to tell Fred about the about another incident. At least, she was thinking, I didn't even look for anything unusual until two different passengers pointed it out to me. The thing that bothered all three of the flight attendants most was the missing pages in the logbook of plane 318. It makes me mad, Denise said. I think they've got them thoroughly hidden. We came on 318 another time, my roommate and I, after we had another heard another story of Reaple's reappearance. By this time, I was in the habit of flipping through the log every time I got on the plane. We dashed on the plane that day, but it was a brand new book again. The problem now, Doris Elliott said, is that most of this happened over the months that followed the crash. Excuse me. That happened at the end of 1972. I think the stories reached a peak around June in 1973. Isn't that right, Denise? Just about. They were hot and heavy for the first year, I'd say. God, my nose is running. Up until late spring in 1974, maybe June. I don't think I've learned any new, of any new incidents since then. Have you? That's just about right, Doris said. That's why it's hard to pick up any new information. The story seemed to stop very suddenly around March or April of 74. Maybe a little longer. Emily Palmer might be able to pin down a little better for you. If these things were still, if these things were still happening, we'd probably have a pile of, of stories for you, the way we used to get them. The pattern that the girls discerned during the first year after the accident emerged as we talked. Each of them involved the sudden appearance of the, excuse me, each of them involved a sudden appearance in the L-1011s of either Captain Locke or the flight engineer, second officer, Don Repo. They also involved a sudden disappearance. The apparitions were clear, solid, and, I, and identifiable. They would appear and disappear in front of pilots, flight engineers, or flight attendants completely unexpectedly and usually in flight. Most of the stories centered on plane 318, regardless of what route it was assigned to. But flight crews reported other 1011 sister ships to be involved. The appearances of the dead crew members were unpredictable as to time or place. Some flight crews, both cabin and cockpit, expressed a strong desire to experience an encounter with the apparitions. Others shied away from the idea. But there was no consistent pattern. Each time any of the trio was assigned to play three, plane 318, she would immediately look at the logbook. Nearly every time any of them did so, she would find the pages had been removed from the book, or a brand new book had been supplied. This was not consistent with any other sister ships of the L-1011 fleet, where the, where, where the record, where the full record over many weeks filled the logbook. And only rare was a new logbook found after the book had served for many months. By the way, Jenny said, there's one more person you might check. He's a flight engineer based in Boston. He's very interested in this subject. Name is Dick Manning. He has encountered, or has he encountered either of the apparitions, I asked. I better let, you, let him tell you his own story, Jenny said. I think you'll find it interesting. I made a note of his name and the small, and the small town outside of Boston where he lived. She didn't have his phone number, but I hoped it might be in the book. Then Denise said, I think you'll get a lot more general information when you talk with Emily Palmer. She's been keeping better tabs than we have. The three of us only know about our own experiences, even though we've kept, we've kept tales on the others. Emily's got a better overall picture. Denise's evaluation was correct. I met with Emily and her husband, Don, at the hotel for dinner. Don worked as a flight engineer for another airline and had heard many of the stories repeated among his flight crews. After talking with them and with Emily, 
He said, I'm convinced this is a story that just can't be discounted. I really don't believe in ghosts, but I'm broad-minded enough to think that there's always that possibility. That's just about the way I feel, Emily said. I haven't seen any of these apparitions myself, but I have no reason to doubt the crew members who told them to me. But there is still the problem of no one of no one wanting to be identified. They'll talk to me informally, but that's it. In some cases, they'll even withdraw the story the next day. They'll ask me to forget about what they told me only the day before. I asked her, are all the stories centered on, on Plane 318? The majority of them, she said. But there are other L-1011s involved, too. She brought out her notes, and we went through them carefully. I'm not a reporter, remember, she said. And those are all rather sketchy. I've been keeping them just for my own interest and because I'm convinced that there's something to them. These people are not idiots. The flight crews would not be flying if they were. So how do you explain it? If these things happen, then it's one of the damnedest stories you could ever run into. If it didn't happen, it's still the same. Why would same people bring these things up? They have nothing to gain by it. I'm puzzled by it all. That's, that's what I am. The notes were very interesting and quite complete, considering she was just keeping them for her own interest. JFK, L-1011, Flight Miami turnaround. Plane being fueled and checked. Eastern Vice President pre-boarded the plane prior to regular passengers. VP entered first class section, which was empty except for an Eastern captain in uniform. VP stopped by the captain to say hello. After the greeting, the VP suddenly realized he was talking to Bob Loft, the deceased captain. Loft suddenly simply vanished. Disappeared, disappeared. VP went immediately out to ramp agent. Com complete search of plane and area was made. No sign of any captain found. No deadhead pilot was found on the passenger manifest list. Told to me by JFK crew who asked that, who asked that, you know, not reveal the vice president's name. Captain Loft seen again in first class section in New York, JFK, by flight captain and two flight attendants. They talked to him and he disappeared. Flight was canceled. Told to me by captain involved, asked me to keep his name out. Confidential flight attendant, New York to Miami, does not want name mentioned. Pulled back, pulled back compartment door on overhead bin during pre-flight check. First class cabin, new captain loft. Had flown with him on many flights before the crash. Found herself looking directly into his face in the compartment. Ooh, that's creepy. <laughs> Aircraft involved seem to be more than one report coming from 317. 308, others flight, others flight attendant Miami reported to open door in galley oven compartment. Soft base of second officer Don Repo there, clearly. Denise W. tells me they were, they were watching a crew of Marriott caterers boarding the food carriers of food trays on plane 318. She and another flight attendant saw a sudden commotion. The caterer and crew had left the plane and did not want to go back because they said they saw a flight engineer standing in the galley who instantly disappeared before their eyes launched. There was a long delay before they could be persuaded to continue loading the plane. Very excitable. Plane 318 from New York over Everglades on approach pattern to Miami. Male voice came over the PA system to announce customary seatbelt and no smoking precaution to the passengers and crew. To the passengers and crew, no one in the plane's crew, either cockpit or cabin, claims to have made the announcement. And PA system was not in use at all during the time period. L-1011 flight plane 318. Atlanta, Miami, second officer sitting at engineer's panel, monitoring the flight of the ship. Heard loud knocking coming from the compartment below cockpit down in the hellhole. Engineer went to, went to the trap door in the floor, turned flashlight on, and scanned the whole area below. Nothing unusual there. Compartment was empty. And says he clearly saw the... Oh, compartment empty. Looked back at engineer's panel. Says he clearly saw the face of Repo. Had known Repo well. Entered incident on planes log. Asked me to keep name confidential. L-1011. Location not specified. Flight engineer came to flight deck before doing walk around pre-flight inspection. An engineering, an engineering panel. Man in eastern second officer's uniform sitting in his seat at the panel. The engineer quickly recognized him as Don Repo. The apparition of Repo said something like, you don't need to worry about the pre-flight. I've already done it. Almost immediately, the three-dimensional image of Repo disappeared. Vanished. Vanished. L-1011 stewardess in lower galley, preparing meals while in flight, discovered the right bay number one oven, indicated an overload circuit. A man in engineer's uniform appeared within a few moments. Shortly after that, another flight engineer appeared, asking what was wrong with the oven. 
New arrival insisted he was only an engineer on the plane. Later, the flight attendant looked up Rifo's picture, who she immediately identified as the man who first fixed the oven. The oven Newark, Newark crew asked, Newark crew's kid tells me confidentially that Captain came off San Juan flight and told him of a direct encounter with Repo. Repo was supposed to have said there will never be another crash of an L-1011. We will not let it happen. One particular story that intrigued Emily Palmer involved a woman passenger in the first class section of plane 318, scheduled for New York to Miami flight. The plane was still at the ramp and the head count had not yet been taken by the flight attendant in the first class section. The woman was seated next to an Eastern flight officer in the, in, in the uniform of a flight engineer. Something about the officer worried, worried the woman. He looked sick and pale. And when she said something to him, he would not respond. She asked him if he was all right and, sh and, 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 and should she call the stewardess to help him. There was still no response. The woman became disturbed and called the stewardess, who agreed that the flight officer seemed ill. She asked him if she could help. Several other passengers also noticed him. Then, in front of the group, as before, the flight engineer simply disappeared. Everyone was disconcerted, but the woman became hysterical. When she arrived in Miami, she demanded that she be shown pictures of the Eastern flight, of, uh, flight engineers to try to identify the man. According to the story, both she and the stewardess involved picked out a picture of Repo as the officer who had been in the first class seat. Emily tried for several weeks to track down the story to its source. She had learned of it from four independent sources at four different, at four different times. All were Eastern employees, a flight attendant, a second officer, a ramp agent, and a mechanic. All told the identical story almost down in the last detail. She could not trace the date or the flight number, nor could she locate the crew members involved. It was illustrative, <clears throat> illustrative of the difficulty in tracking. Illustrative, I'm sorry. God, it's one of those days. It, it was illustrative of the difficulty in tracking down the stories in an airline with so many employees and so many daily flights. There were the other reasons, of course. The fear of ridicule. The fear of being sent to a psychiatrist and the general concern that anyone has when it comes to reporting such an elusive thing as a ghost. But Emily kept her notes as accurately as she could. Some came directly from the crews involved, some came indirectly. She was lax on dates and times, but it assured herself, at least, of the validity of her associates she gathered the information from. She made her notes beginning in mid-1973 and continued through the rest of that year and into the next. As she did so, she noticed a considerable trend that others confirmed. The stories about Bob Loft were fading out, and the stories about Don Repo were increasing in frequency. One thing that appeared evident to her was that all the events concerning Repo seemed to indicate that he was on board to help out whatever flight was involved. Unlike the classic ghost stories, there seemed to be nothing sinister about them. She counted about two dozen events concerning the apparitions. Most of them con continued to center on Plane 318, although not exclusively. Emily found herself wishing she could run into one of the apparitions directly. Although she flew L-1011s almost exclusively, including number 318, she never had the luck to encounter either Repo or Loft. The reports were coming in so fast that it was difficult for Emily to tabulate them. By her judgment, they were coming in from sane and logical people who were not prone to, to exaggerate and who, for the most part, were thoroughly experienced airline employees. They had flown in many kinds of planes, but never had encountered the phenomena in any planes except the L-1011s. What was also difficult to understand was that the appearances seemed to involve full-body three-dimensional figures of the former captain and the second officer, and that there was actual communication with them. It was quite easy to laugh the incidents off. Obviously, many could be discounted, but many could not be told in full because of the reluctance of those who experienced the incidents to be identified. Flight crews especially are trained in observation and in the realities of flying and navigation and have no desire to become involved in a series of events that are in inexplicable in terms of engineering, physics, or mechanics. Yet the reports were persistently being made, and they circulated fast. Almost every airline crew member on any airline, including some foreign ones, knew of the stories by the end of 1973. The series of events was beginning to have, it, have its effects on the flying crews mostly stewardesses whom Emily talked with were intensely interested and afraid, but some simply could not get themselves to work down the lower galleys of 318 or many of the other 1011s. Others told her that they were eager to work down there in the hope of finding some answer to the riddle. None was afraid of the plane itself or of any of the L-1011s. 
It was a long dinner. By the time the table was cleared, the waiters were glancing at us, obviously anxious to close the dining room. We apologized and went up to my room to continue our discussion. John's problem, Don told Emily, is to get more direct information. Emily, you're flying in planes constantly. Even with that, it's like mining for gold. Let's say there have been two dozen incidents. If you multiply the number of people in the flight crews Eastern has by the number of passenger miles they fly every day, it's like hunting for a needle in a haystack. Another problem is that I hear the stories faded out around a year ago, last spring. In 1974, is that right? I, I said. That is right, Emily said. I haven't run into any recently at all. She thought a moment and then added, did Denise and, 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 and Ginny tell you about the incident in New York where the apparition of Captain Lopp was in first class and the flight captain came out of the cockpit and identified him? I said that she did. I know that, Cap I know that captain fairly well, Emily said. He told me the story directly. There was no nonsense about it. If he gives me permission to let you know his name, I'll, get, I'll give it to you and you can call him yourself. I talked to Emily on the phone for uh, about a week later. The captain's name was George Fisher, and he told her that he'd talk to me if I called. I put in a call immediately, and he answered. I told him I was interested in the strange event that happened in Newark, and that Emily Palmer had said it would be all right to call him. There was a moment of silence on the other end of the phone, and then Captain Fisher said, Yes, I did tell Emily that, but I've been thinking about it ever since. You'll have to forgive me, but I just don't feel I should talk about it. Thanks for calling anyway. He was polite but firm. There was no way I could get him to talk. Nothing else to do but end the conversation. It was more of the first it was more of the frustrating things that seemed to be blocking the research constantly. I began to wonder if there if there was any way at all of cracking the story open. Just on principle, I hated to quit. Somehow I felt that the story was more important than just a ghost story. I knew I was going to continue if only out of, out of stubbornness. But I also knew there wouldn't be any pat answer as to how to get around the obstacles. Next chapter. There was a picture shaping up, but it was a jumbled mosaic. There was a lot to follow up on. The flight engineer in Boston that Ginny had told me about, the pilots who were mediums, the FAA supervisor who also incredibly was a medium, the New York mechanic, and I particularly wanted to track down the story of the Mexico City incident that had been written up in the Flight Safety Foundation Bulletin. The sources were scattered. I knew the job would continue to be frustrating. From what I gathered from the four flight attendants, the new L-1011 series had continued to gain in popularity with both cockpit and cabin crews, in spite of the crash and the stories about the apparitions. Passengers continued to like it for its spaciousness and quiet. Not many passengers knew of the phenomenon. But Emily had mentioned that she had run into some who sought out the L-1011 to learn more about it or in the hope of experiencing it. There was general agreement that in spite of the long series of events that were being reported, there was nothing dangerous or harmful about the incidents. The stories involving Don Repo, for instance, seemed to point to his wanting to help with the airplane. Whatever L-1011 flight was involved, if this was a ghost, it was a good ghost. During this time, the minor troubles with the 1011 fleet were being ironed out successfully. Other flight attendants, like Denise Woodruff, described themselves as L-1011 freaks and preferred not to work on any other plane. More of the giant jets were coming online, each one costing close to $20 million for the eventual total of 49 of the craft. But the planes were capable of producing up to $75,000 worth of revenue a day, and the investment was worth it. Like other airlines, Eastern was having its troubles with both inflation and recession. The big new jumbo jets could help them get back in the running. But the events could be startling. As the anniversary of the tragedy passed and, and 1974 came in, one Eastern captain told a reporter that, that, that he would ring, in the report, would ring the reporter's neck if his name was mentioned, but that he was warned by a flight engineer riding in the jump seat of his L-1011 that there was going to be an electrical failure. Without even thinking about it, the captain called for a recheck, and a circuit was discovered to be faulty. Later, after a double take, the rest of the cockpit crew identified the intruding second officer, sitting in the jump seat, as Don Repo. I decided to attack the Mexico City incident first. I asked Rachel to dig into the Miami FAA records to see what she could find. A check with the Flight Safety Foundation revealed that the story had come to them from several different pilot sources at Eastern but that they were not at liberty to reveal any names. Rachel returned from the FAA office with several documents 
available through the Freedom of Information Act, which fortunately gives journalists access to government material not listed as secret or confidential. We tracked down the flight numbers, the route of the plane 318 at the time, and the official reports of the mechanical problem with the engines, known as the MRR reports. We could not get hold of Eastern logbooks because they were sealed in the company vaults and, as private files, were not available under the Freedom of Information Act. These would be the only record of the alleged appearance of Second Officer Repo's apparition, and it was impossible to obtain. If what Denise Woodruff and Doris Elliott had said was true, the logbook would have been immediately whisked off the plane and a new one substituted. We were able to locate one Eastern technician who could check the files, and he brought back word that the reports from that time period, February 1974, were no longer in the files. This particular story was so well known that I had gathered several versions of it from Eastern flight attendants on several of my trips over the previous few months. The stories were amazingly consistent, but this may have been because of the flight safety bulletin report. Also missing were the names of the Eastern crew members involved, both cockpit and cabin. These, too, would be recorded only in the unavailable logs. This was a weak point, and I knew it, but there was nothing to be done about it. I decided to make one stab at Eastern officialdom, knowing that it would be futile. I called Eastern Public Relations and was put in touch with Jim Ashlock of that office. I told him that I was interested in the persistent stories of the apparitions and wondered what Eastern's point of view was on the matter. He summed it up rather succinctly. Well, he said in a pleasant southern drawl, we think it's a bunch of crap. That's all it is. I asked him if he had done any checking on it. I guess I did the most extensive checking on it that anybody ever did. He said, I checked all through the logs. There's nothing in them at all. Have you talked to any of the people who reported the stories? I asked. Nobody's ever reported it. He said, there's no track to anybody having reported it. I think it's entirely an insight into the phenomena of rumor. Of course, ghost stories relative to, to modes of transportation go back as far as you want to go. The Flying Dutchman, the Ghost Ships of the Sea, the Rod Serling series played a lot into it. The thing I... The thing I could figure out was that it was an outgrowth of the somewhat extensive publicity around the 1011, the first wide body accident, stuff like that. His response was just about what I had been led to suspect. I couldn't help wonder why I had been able to get a few, you know, quite a few people to talk about while well, he seemed unable to. In fact, early in the day, I had talked with a friend of mine who was an Eastern pilot who had confidential, confidentially tried to dig up some information for me. He was unable to get any specific information over his previous trip, but he did say that some of his fellow crew members had seen some of the logbook reports of plane, eight, uh, plane 318, and they were really wild, unbelievable. This, of course, was in conflict with Jim Ashlock's statement. As expected, my request to look at some of Plane 318's logbooks was rejected, and I went back over the material R Rachel had assembled. Along with my notes scrawled out on various flights, in the past few months to see what could put together about the Mexico City incident. Another mosaic formed, and it was intriguing, even if inconclusive. In February, by February 1984, Plane 318 was making several trips on the Mexico City run. Early in that month, 318 was proceeding on its endless round of routine flights, all under one of the various flight numbers to which it was assigned. It flew routinely from Palm Beach to Kennedy in New York, as Flight 191, then proceeded on a turnaround back to Palm Beach as Flight 196. All were uneventful. The problems were simple and easy to cope with. The coffee maker was stubborn and refused to work right. The mushroom on the floor of the uh, cabin, a device that locks and claps the food beverage cart securely to the floor, was troublesome and failed to lock the cart securely. As Flight 191 again, Plane 318 went back to Kennedy, where it was assigned to Flight 903, a New York to Mexico City run. On 903, the lower galley flight attendant was going through the usual routine of preparing the food carts on the trip. Like every other stewardess, Eastern or other, she was aware of the stories about the continual appearances of Second Officer Repo, and was as was the flight deck crew on her flight. In fact, she had known Don Repo and was well aware of what he looked like. Like every flight attendant who now worked in the L-1011 galleys, she also knew the reports of what had happened with the oven doors on many flights. The reflection theory had been widely circulated as the answer to to the, to the issue, but as a theory, it could not hold up. If numerous other non-galley incidents were reliably reported, as many insisted they were, what happened on 318's flight to Mexico City came quickly, 
<clears throat> came quickly and unexpectedly. The stewardess looked at the window of one of the ovens and clearly saw the face of Don Repo looking out at her. She immediately ran to the elevator, the only exit to the passenger cabin except for an emergency panel, and the ceiling. On the main deck, she grabbed the first stewardess she could find. Together, they went down the galley and crossed the oven. The second stewardess clearly saw the same image, and there was no question of, of its not being a reflection. They called the flight deck and gave the story to the flight engineer there. He came down immediately. Repo's face was now clearly formed, and the engineer recognized him. In addition to that, he spoke audibly to the engineer. Watch out for fire on this airplane, he said. Then he disappeared completely. The plane landed without incident in Mexico City. The event was reported by an aviation safety insurance newsletter to be entered in the craft's log. But when the, when the engines were turned over for continuation of the flight in Hotel Acapulco, the number three engine on the starboard wing would not start. The repair job was apparently a major one and required a full engine replacement that had to be done at the Miami base. A ferry crew was dispatched from Miami to handle the job of bringing the craft back from Mexico City on two engines. Since the L-1011s are designed with plenty of reserve power, they could both take off and land easily with, with two engines. With a single engine, they could not land. But the, they could only land. I'm sorry, with a single engine, they could land but, but not take off. In Mexico City's high altitude, care would have to be taken. The thin air reduced the lift considerably at the 6,000-foot altitude of the airport. In many high-altitude airports, such as the one at Mexico City, planes are permitted to land and only, only early in the morning or after sunset because the high temperatures of a tropical day can combine with the rarefied air to reduce the lift so critically that the plane never leaves the ground and ends up crashing at the end of the runway. The temperature was not a problem here, but the altitude was. Even with all three engines, a takeoff needed careful attention. Plane 318's ferry trip was assigned to flight number 7200. And the, ferry crew war as the ferry, and the ferry crew warmed up the engines at idle speed for about four minutes, then taxied the empty plane down toward the end of the runway. Cleared for takeoff, the captain pushed the throttles of the two, of the two operating engines forward and began the takeoff. They reached the three stages of the takeoff at the expected marks. V1, where the plane was approaching takeoff speed, but could, but could be aborted if necessary. VR, where the steering column was pulled back to lift the plane in the process of known as rotation. And V2, where the plane was definitely committed to takeoff and could not be turned back under any conditions at all. At the altitude of 50 feet, barely off the ground in the thin air where the lift was minimal, engine one stalled and then rapidly backfired several times. It had to be shut off immediately, leaving only one engine, number two, operating. The plane was forced to climb to an altitude safe enough for the plane to circle and get back to the runway. The captain quickly discharged the carbon dioxide fire agent, preventing the engine from bursting into flames. Then the plane climbed on a single engine slow, slowly to 400 feet, enough to circle the airport and get back to the runway. It was a masterful job of plane handling. Some considered it miraculous that the plane was able to continue climbing and be brought back to safety on one engine, under these conditions and the high airport altitude. New engines were shipped down to Mexico City, Engines 10109 and 102.11 were replaced on the number one and number three positions. Cockpit voice recorder, the CVR number, was replaced by number 16993 by Eastern Maintenance. Again, Plane 318 was well and healthy again, and back in service. But one thing was noteworthy. An entire disassembly of number one engine showed no reason whatsoever for the engine to stall and backfire. I was a little puzzled why the cockpit voice recorder was replaced. Certainly, it had nothing to do with the faulty engines. Could this have anything to do with the vague rumors that parts were being taken off 318 because they seemed to be connected with the, with, with the appearances of the apparitions? It was a wild idea, and I tabled it. I couldn't help feeling that whether the stories were real or not, they were in one way or another affecting the operation of one of the largest airlines in the country without endangering lives, but creating major mystification among a large segment of Eastern's 30,000 employees. Reports kept coming in from Elizabeth Manzoni. Manzioni. Her travels with Northwest Orient Airlines took her, to, took her to Eastern airline bases all over the East and, Mid and Midwest. Many of them were repeats of the various incidents, but they all had remarkable consistency about them. It seemed that there was, there was practically no one in Eastern or in most of the airlines who didn't know about the incidents. She had tracked down several direct sources and wanted to know if she should interview them. Since she had time off in between regular trips, I asked her if she wanted to work on a regular fee basis during these times. 
She was so interested in the story by now that she agreed. She had an uncanny ability for making friends with people she interviewed, and being a flight attendant herself, she could relate to them as well. Meanwhile, I received a call from Rachel while I was still in New York. While I was trying to assess and analyze my long discussion with Eastern pilots, she and JR had been continuing to dig in the Miami area with some interesting results. I learned more about the FAA executive who was interested in parapsychology. She said, You're going to stop in Atlanta to see him? I plan to, I said. She went on to tell me some of the details of his work and said, I've learned that he's highly interested in the psychic field, not just superficially. Just wanted to make sure you weren't going to miss him. Nope, I said. I'm going to head down there in a couple of days. Anything else new? We got a lot of supportive material. I'll tell you all about it when you get down here. He described some of it. It would be very helpful. The, source, the sources would have, have to be protected, and I would have to be careful in the way I used it. I was encouraged by this material because it had a considerable amount of, solid, of solidity to the base of this tantalizing and perplexing story. One other thing, Rachel said. Believe it or not, JR has found another medium who works for Eastern. She's based in New York and works in ticketing. She has a lot of friends down here and comes down to visit them often. He feels sure she'll be able to help. She's very interested in the case. Her name is Laura Breitbart. I still couldn't get over my long interview with the pilots and the fact that there were so many full-blooded mediums around. Those connected with the airline business were especially interesting. They would be able to uh, excuse me, they would be able to evaluate the situation from both the aviation and the psychic aspects. This seemed to me to be an unusual combination and one that I certainly never expected to find. I finally reached Bill Damroth, the FAA supervisor from the Atlanta area, by phone. He agreed to talk with me when I got down there. I met him and his wife at their pleasant, modest suburban home. He was a quiet, thoughtful man in his 50s, soft-spoken and serious. I was curious about how he got interested in the psychic field and he said, I always used to be a hard and fast skeptic. I thought it was strictly for kooks. My background is technical, and so is my career. That whole thing started for me when I visited some close friends of ours in the Midwest. The husband is an, is an executive with American Airlines, and you never met anyone more sane and sober. He was very active with a psychic group, and I went with him to some of the meetings. I didn't pay much attention to it at first. Then I talked with several mediums, and they came out with information about me that there was no way for them to know. It threw me. So did a couple of seances they had. Then I did a little digging into the background and found, into the background and found that it wasn't as illogical as I thought. I found a spiritualist church, and they had classes. Then I discovered I had some ability along, along this field myself. You know, the problem is that people are afraid of this sort of thing. They can't tell you why. They just are. My theory is they don't know enough about it. We tend to be afraid of the unknown. I discovered that Bill Damroth was very interested in psychic healing and had been con concentrating on that. He had not become involved in Eastern incidents, but was intrigued by them. He promised to see what he could find out about the story and would get back to me. I think you're going to find, he told me as I was leaving, there's a lot more truth to this than you've ever realized. As a matter of fact, have you thought of trying to contact Repo through a medium? I told him about the same suggestion from others, but that the whole thing was so foreign to me personally, I didn't know what to think. Think about it, he said. Before I left Miami for Atlanta, I put in a long-distance call to the TWA pilot who Emily Palmer had told me about. I wanted to climb down away from this rarefied atmosphere of psychic and talk to someone purely on the technical side. I reached Captain Al Morgan by phone. As in all the contacts I made on the story, I always felt a little sheepish in approaching someone about it, because it was such a strange story. I felt awkward and even embarrassed. It wasn't like an ordinary journalistic interview, where you went after facts that anyone would be familiar with. Self-consciously, I didn't want the person on the other end of the phone to think that I was a kook. Converse conversely, I wanted to reassure whomever I was calling that I didn't think he was a kook. I think these were the hardest interviews I had yet went across. After he was assured I would not use his real name, Captain Morgan did much to relieve, to relieve my feelings about this. All I can tell you is hearsay, he said, because it, did, it has not happened to me. I don't fly 1011s, but I've heard from many people I respect that a hostess went down the galley below on one of the L1011s released from Eastern. We heard noises unlike those she had ever heard on any airplane before. She called the flight engineer, and he came down but he couldn't identify the noises either. 
They were completely foreign to anything in an aircraft. So the girls just refused to go down the galley anymore. But in addition to that, we went into Phoenix one night. It was an L-1011 park there with police cars all around it with their beacon lights rotating. We wondered what was happening. Then Captain Morgan went on to describe the incident, Phoenix in detail. In the off-season, during the hot summer months, Easter made a practice of leasing some of their 1011s to TWA. Since the light flow of the traffic during that season could not fill them, Captain Morgan pulled his plane up to the ramp in Phoenix at 1 a.m. On this trip, he was flying in a Boeing 727. There was one of the L-1011s leased, leased from Eastern at the ramp next to his. His attention was attracted by several police cars surrounding the L-1011, their rotating lights whirling around and the domes on top of their cars. Captain Morgan and his cockpit crew had a 45-minute wait before their 727 flight continued. They deplaned and went over to the scene to find out what was going on. They discovered that the L-1011 was on a continuing through flight with several stops en route. A woman in, coach, in the coach section had been perfectly quiet and undisturbed through the flight up until the time the plane approached Phoenix. Quite suddenly, she began screaming and said that a man had suddenly appeared in a seat next to her. She had been looking directly at the seat. The man had not walked up to it, she claimed. He had just suddenly come into being there. Then he had disappeared the minute she started screaming. The cabin crew could not quiet her down and finally had to call the police. She became so hysterical that they had to take her off in a straitjacket. The incident piqued TWA Captain Morgan's curiosity. Later, he began making inquiries among other TWA pilots and maintenance men who flew and serviced the Elton 11s released for, you know, least from Eastern. He did not believe in apparitions, but he had an open mind. A TWA pilot and co-pilot told him that they had been going through a pre-flight check on the 1011 lease from Eastern. They didn't recall the plane number, so they weren't sure that 318 was involved. One of them noticed another man in the cockpit jump seat. He too disappeared in front of their eyes. They called the flight attendant to the cabin to ask who had entered the cockpit. The attendant swore that no one had gone in or out from the time that they boarded the plane, which the you know, with the pilot and co-pilot. There were several other TWA reports similar to the Eastern incidents in both the galley and flight deck. Along with these incidents, Captain Morgan learned more about the salvage parts theory from TWA maintenance. The maintenance man, men had heard from their counterparts at Eastern that all the events that had taken place since the first, since the first had been reported, seemed to center on those L-1011s which had been equipped with non-structural parts salvaged from the wrecked plane in the Everglades. These were said to include radios and other electronic and avionic instruments that had been carefully checked and rebuilt so that they were perfectly operative and in sound condition. There was nothing wrong in this process as long as the equipment met, met rigorous tests. The rationale for the use of rebuilt equipment was not, hurt, was not hard to understand. The electronic and avionic equipment for each plane runs into, th into thousands and thousands of dollars. If the parts are salvageable and can meet the strict testing procedure, there is no reason why they should not be used. Another rationale for using any possible salvageable equipment was that the 1011s were behind schedule and coming off the line from Lockheed. Delays were encountered because critical parts were slow in delivery, holding up a plane that was otherwise ready for service. Many parts were simply not there when they were needed. It would not then, it would not then be just a question of economics, but of time schedule. Captain Nor Morgan learned of another story that was emanating from Eastern operations. Certain parts of the galley equipment, such as elevators and the stainless steel ovens from the Rec 1011, have been in good enough condition to be used in some of her sister ships. Again, this would be perfectly, a perfectly safe practice, since the equipment had to be thoroughly tested before it was put to use. The parts were not part of the basic structure of the plane, so that, so that no hidden stress problems would be found. All this led to the question, why was the phenomenon alleged to take place only on those planes that utilized some of the parts and equipment from the ill-fated Flight 401? These things are very, very strange to me, Captain Morgan said. I don't believe in apparitions, but I also have an open mind. And you wonder if there is something connected to it. I have heard that this takes place only on 1011s that are equipped with some galley equipment from the wrecked plane. Now there's one, now there's one other thing. There's a service area on the plane for hydraulics. And there's a light switch they throw on so they can service the area. And they can't understand why the light in this one particular airplane will not stay eliminated. Illuminated. There's always seems to be some something that will keep that light out. 
So the mechanics won't go up and service that part of the airplane after dark. But on the other hand, the, f the fellows I know who fly the 1011 think it's the best plane ever. They think it's far superior to the 747. This was a consistent report I was getting from Eastern Flight crew members, and it spoke well for the plane. The series of incidents did nothing to diminish the confidence. If anything, they re it, re it reinforced it because the apparent benevolent attitude reflected in the appearances. The uneasiness reflected by some had nothing to do with the performance of the plane. Now, I have heard, Captain Morgan continued, that there have been sane and sober cockpit members from Eastern that simultaneously that that the same, I can't, I'm having trouble with these words. Sim, sim, maybe because I'm talking too fast. Simultaneously, see, spotted spotted a fourth crew member in the cockpit. Have you heard that? I told him that I had from several different sources and that I was getting more details. He was interested. He said that if he had any more information, he would let me know. The interview with Captain Morgan was successful, but again frustrating. I didn't have any idea of where I stood on the story. But I knew it was growing more intriguing. It was also becoming a minor obsession. There was a lot of smoke. It seemed that there just had to be some fire somewhere. What still nagged at me was that if the stories were, sim were, were simply vague and wispy rumors, they would be bound to shift base. If only to a 727, DC-10, or a 747. But they stuck and stuck hard, both to the Elton 11s and to Eastern. The only time they moved away from Eastern was when some of the planes were leased to TWA. What's more, the reports were coming from responsible professionals. They were still too vague to be conclusive, but it was just as strange that they had been so persistent as it was strange to believe, to believe in them. When the TWA captain mentioned the rumor that the parts of Plane 318 had been removed for apparently no reason, I thought of contacting Gary Lewis, the New York mechanic JR and Rachel had learned about in New York. Since he had worked temporarily in Miami during the time when the apparition stories had reached flood tide, I was hoping he could shed some light on the, on the matter. I had to go to New York for several days, and I called him at his Suffolk County home on Long Island. While there's no question that there's a lot of funny stuff going on about the ghosts, he said, both in the air and on the ground, I think you've got to believe some of it. I persuaded him to let me come out to his house for a few moments and drove out to Long Island the next morning since he was on the late shift. With him in the living room was another Eastern mechanic, Frank Keller. Both were salty, down-to-earth men, and they seemed to have a no-nonsense approach to the story. I asked Heller over, over here. I asked Heller over here, Gary Lewis said, because what he has to say will sort of back me up. You don't like to feel lonely in this business. Matter of fact, Frank's had a, Frank's had a real experience. I've just, been I've just been watching from the sidelines. Why don't you tell the story, Frank? Okay, both the mechanic, <clears throat> excuse me, both the mechanics went through practically the same procedure as the other Eastern employees I taught that I talked with. They had to be guaranteed that their names would not be used. I was perfectly willing to guarantee this, and I told them so. It was not only that I don't want to look like a damn fool, Hiller said, and got and get the pants kicked off me, but I'm sure you've heard all the stories about people being sent to the shrink because of this. But anyway, what happened is. I was working down the galley, the lower galley, where a lot of this stuff is supposed to have happened. They were filling the fuel tanks, and all the power in the plane was shut off. All of it. Strict procedure. A friend of mine was down there with me, and we had a few minor things to adjust. Remember, there was no power on that plane at all. But all of a sudden, the galley fan came on. you never seen two guys get the hell out of that place faster. We checked the electrical foreman right away. He agreed with us. There was no way it could have come on, even with the short circuit. Even with the short circuit. Heller's not the only one who's run into strange things on 318, Gary said. Jack Durr works with us on our ship. About a year ago, he was down the lower bay. He couldn't find his screwdriver. He put his hands out to the sides, palms up, the way you would do when you can't find something you're looking for. All of a sudden, he felt something as if it was slapped in his hand. It was the missing screwdriver. No one else was anywhere near him on the plane. He told us he had run off the plane and got himself under control. These stories came in direct to Gary, but we talked about how hard it was to nail them down. The others, especially since they had died down over the years. You're going to have a hard time doing this, he said, echoing the others. But let me tell you what I've run into. It's a very curious thing, and I'm really puzzled about it. 
He continued with the story. Like nearly everybody else at Eastern, Gary was aware of the dozens of stories and was struck by the consistency and reliability of those who reported them. As a New York-based mechanic for Eastern, working temp temporarily at Miami, he knew the workings of the 727s and L1011s intimately. He had been working on 727s recently, however, and did not have direct knowledge of what was happening on the 1011s. Later, his interest in the long series of events still high, Gary found himself back working on 1011 maintenance after a long stint on the 727s. Working in another part of the plane, he happened to notice part of the crew removing one of the elevators that had carried the stewardesses down the lower galley. There had been minor bugs in the early planes of the 1011 series, nothing serious, but often annoying. One of the bugs involved the elevators, and some of, and some of them had to be changed when the often delayed delivery of the new ones arrived. As Lewis passed the crew removing the old elevator and replacing it with the new one, he said, That damn thing crap, crap out again? Nope, one of the mechanics told him. This one works fine. Well, how come you're changing it? You won't believe it, the mechanic said, but this is one of the parts that came off from the crack up of Flight 401. There was a work order to remove it. Lewis asked why they were removing it when it was perfectly good. The mechanic told him that word going around was that the reappearances of the ghost images seemed to be directly connected with those L-1011s using salvage parts for the Flight 401 plane. How'd you find that out? Lewis asked. Ask him over in stock. That's where we found out. Later on his lunch break, Lewis went over to the stock department. Here, all the costly electronic equipment was stored and cataloged by serial number after it had been checked, overhauled, tested, and inspected in the shops. It was, it was expensive stuff. A small piece of equipment could cost thousands of thousands of dollars. The stock records indicated the serial numbers of each part and also a record of what plane it was on or is on. From the stockman, Gary Lewis learned that they, were, that they were going through all the records to find out which of the L-1011s were, were utilizing the salvage radio parts from the plane that had crashed in the Everglades. They were checking all the equipment, taking down the serial numbers, and matching them up with the records of the 1011 that had crashed. The radio men, Lewis was told, would then remove any part that had been salvaged from the plane, even though it was in perfect working condition. It just didn't add up. Could it be possible that all this labor was being done because of the strange series of, of ghost-like appearances on the planes? It was hard to believe. It was also hard for Lewis to learn any more than what he had heard from the mechanics and stockmen. There were two things that were fully confirmable, however. One was that the computers from the avionic flight control system, AFCS, of the wrecked plane, except for the roll computers, were installed in another L-1011 for testing, indicating that they were operational after the crash and demonstrating that parts from the wreckage could be used in addition, could be used. In addition, there was no question that the CVR, the cockpit voice recorder, number 14236, from plane 3AT, was removed after the Mexico City incident. Okay, so we got through two and a half chapters, and we're going to stop there today. We have three hours and eight minutes left on this, so again, we'll um, probably have two more weekends to read. So that's kind of cool before we, before we shift gears. But I'm glad you guys were here to join me for this. I'm going to shut this thing down. You can hear AT&T sing. There we go. Boom. Um, I'm enjoying this. I love this book. I read this book as a, as, as a teenager. And I have kept it all my life in one form or another. It got so tattered it fell in the toilet once. Not dirty toilet, but toilet. And I still pried the pages together after, you know, while it was wet to save it. I'm in there. I was in there with a blow dryer trying to, you know, save the pages. I love this book so much. It's it's hard to find now, so I was very fortunate to find it for Kindle. But um, yeah, so it's a great book. So we'll be back next Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific to uh, read uh, two more chapters out of here, and it might go three chapters. Some of these chapters are longer than others, so you know it just varies. But we're getting there, and I think we're going to have two more days, uh, two more days of reading, and then we'll be shifting gears into some horror novels, some some different kind of ghosty horror horror books written by um, my my good friend, and uh, be doing that. But I want to thank you guys for coming today. Tomorrow at six thirty p.m., we're back on the air with California Haunts Radio, and I have a great interview set up for you with a with a um, psychological. Uh, God, my, I just got to think I'm tired. Once I get done reading the book, I get like, blah. Uh, profiler. 
And so we're going to be talking with him, and uh, it should be a good show. And I want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, we are the California Haunts Paranormal Investigation Team based out of Sacramento, California. You can find the team at californiahaunts.org or come visit the radio website at californiahauntsradio.com. And we're there, and you can get all our archives for the show. And uh, actually, I'm not, I don't have it flashing below the screen, but we are nonprofit. So if you could find, actually, let's go back to share it. If you like, <laughs> I'm ahead of myself. So excited to be done tonight. If you like the show, share it with five people. If you hated the show, share it with five, share it with five of your enemies for equal opportunity here. And because uh, we want to get the word out about this show. And if you go back over our archives, you'll see just what I'm talking about. If you're watching from YouTube, please, please, please take a look down at your lower right-hand corner. You will see the little ghosty guy with the Sherlock Holmes hat on and the magnifying glass. That is our mascot. And that is also how you subscribe to this channel because we're looking for more and more subscribers. So if you click that, you can subscribe. And that will alert you to any new shows we have coming on. And you can, you know, keep an eye on us from there. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, California Haunts is. So everything you see here, backdrop, funny sign, flashy sign, all the other equipment we use, the mics, the computer, the camera, it comes out of my personal pocket, pay for the internet, all the service to do this with StreamYard. So if you could find it in your heart to donate a little bit to me, I would really appreciate it to help me keep this going. That is at paypal.me at California Haunts. And we also have a Venmo. If you're not comfortable with PayPal, go to Venmo, type in California Haunts. You can do it right from there. But I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. And again, I will see you tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Pacific for our criminal profiler. Okay? I'll see you tomorrow.